Yeah. Yeah, I aged quite a bit there. Um, I was asked, actually, by someone during the reception if uh, what I was going to talk about had something to do with the National Science Foundation. The answer is yes, because I'm at the National Science Foundation. But in fact, it is the convergence of all the experiences that you had to sit and listen to, um, which always, by the way, makes me feel quite tired when I hear all that I have done. Um, fortunately, I didn't have to bear all those six grandchildren. That would have been too much. <laughs> I have to bear them when I visit, but that's a different kind of thing. Um, but it's the convergence of all of that experience and my own sense of commitment and mission with what I've learned since going to the National Science Foundation. And for those of you who may know what it's like to be in government service, I, I have to issue the disclaimer that these are my ideas, uh, not necessarily those of the National Science Foundation, although if, if I have my way, they will be. <laughs> the premise that I'm starting with, and I hope to develop for you this afternoon, is that university outreach, as in, including outreach from the Institute here, can change both the institution and society. And what I want to talk about is what is the mechanism by which this mutual influence can occur, what does the university offer the community, and what does the community offer the university. These are issues I've been interested in over now a couple of decades. And my understanding of them continues to develop as I see more examples of university-community relationships. The answer is that any kind of deep expertise, whether it's about developing a community or it's about a question involving human nature or a basic problem in physical or natural sciences or literature or the social sciences, consists not only of acquiring an explicit knowledge of that field, but also the practices of a community of people who are interested in those topics and then the interplay between the two. Uh, not too long ago, I stumbled back on an article that was written by John Seeley Brown in 2000. I read it when I was still a university president, and I recall thinking that somehow I needed to go from that fairly theoretical concept which was very much about engagement to the daily practices that underlie the relationships. I picked one e example of a quote. Learning all this requires immersion in a community of practice, in culturation and its ways of seeing, interpreting, and acting. In other words, it matters that we're in Pensacola and not in Lawrence, Kansas. Now, it matters to some of you more than others who would not wish to be in Lawrence, Kansas. But it is important that there is a context, a sense of place, and a sense of shared purpose. Now, why do universities and colleges choose to develop relationships, partnerships with a community? Well, they're experimenting with a lot of different versions of these relationships, learning communities, service learning activities, which link uh, an educational outcome that's built into a curricular design with some valuable product that can be used by the community. Community university partnerships in support of something, such as the development of downtown, or a different way of thinking about health care, or a different approach to economic development. Collaborative research models, in, and I will try to give some examples of those in a few minutes, uh, because there are some fundamental effects of partnerships on how research questions develop, who participates in the work, and how the results are used, and then various kinds of outreach and engagement activities. Why do they do this? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but the primary ones are partly to ensure continued financial viability and support from external constituents, because there often are town-gown relationships that have to be nurtured and developed. Often there are difficulties. Uh, some of you who know the history of higher ed know where that came from. That came from the streets of Oxford, and it came from other uh, communities uh, of the original universities in Europe where the members of the town would usually assault the students who wore gowns or vice versa. 
and so town-gown relationships were quite unpleasant in the Middle Ages, to focus on the enhancement of the curriculum and pedagogy and on the fostering of successful student learning because we have over the years grown to understand that people learn better in a real place with real consequences and real people than most people uh, thought. There, there really are schools of thought about learning. Some of you know more about this than I do. But uh, the idea of an embedded or contextual environment for learning has become a, a very important part of the university's hopes for its students. And to establish an institutional culture that's more conducive to change and capable of overcoming barriers to change. Now, what does that mean? From the point of view of being a president or a provost, open to the, the winds blowing between a society and its educational institutions, there is real advantage to the faculty and students having those direct experiences because the ideas that emerge from those interactions, the appreciation for the value of knowledge in society cannot possibly be conveyed in the absence of that direct exposure. Now, there are a number of expected outcomes of engagement, and they vary from one institution to another, from one part of an institution to another. First of all, to prepare students to be good citizens by providing them ways to help the institution itself be a good citizen. This can be done by students either in a service learning activity or in other kinds of community-based work actually working side by side with members of the community and members of a faculty uh, and of a staff to work on some topic of mutual interest. To foster and renew bonds of trust in the community. This is Robert Putnam's social capital. Uh, I am envious of Robert Putnam because he came up with one of the best book titles I've ever seen, Bowling Alone. And this is because he has studied over many, many years what it is that holds a community together, what causes you to trust each other when things aren't going well. And the answer was social groups of various sorts, community groups, uh, service organizations. Uh, and so social capital is the bonds that hold us together in times of both joy and sorrow. And to use the neutrality of the campus or the Institute to provide a common ground where differences of opinion and advocacy for particular points of view, which can often splinter a community into tiny shards, uh, can be addressed in an open and constructive way because the campus provides a sense of, of shared space or public space or, or neutral ground. And also where people with similar goals can come together and create ways to work together which they might not discover on their own. Also to create leadership development opportunities for students. There's nothing quite as focusing to the mind, to rip off a quote from Samuel Johnson, than to be responsible for the outcome of something. In fact, to be responsible for something about other people's lives. To foster a commitment to social and civic responsibility in students, particularly students young enough that these uh, issues of social and emotional maturity are still uh, life stages to be struggled with. To enhance the employability of graduates builds a very strong resume when you've done things in a community. The promotion of learning, both for students and for community members. A way to play a role in creating capacity in the community itself to work on complicated societal problems or issues that are important to that particular community. Uh, this afternoon, Ken bundled me into a van and drove me around Pensacola. Not all of it, the parts he wanted me to see. Uh, I know there are other parts, but, but the parts I saw were very interesting because the effort to maintain a sense of historical presence and at the same time vitality and intellectual strength and to do so in the physical layout of a community, for example, represent the kind of creating capacity I'm, I was thinking of when I prepared this talk to design a more effective way for a campus to contribute to economic and community development. Again, the relationship between the Institute and the, the good citizens of Pensacola represent a very local good example of what I mean by that, and as a means to accomplish a campus mission of service. But it's also 
because of the dynamics it sets up, a path to transformational change, which in higher education is usually defined as changes which go deep into the, the beliefs and culture of an institution, which go broadly across all parts of that institution and are sustained in a meaningful way over time and are quite intentional. One of the most powerful ways to create the capacity for intentional and we hope constructive change is to open up the university and its partner to the unexpected. Universities have a tendency to want to control things. Now, that's only exceeded by the government. <laughs> so what is engagement? Uh, one of the things I enjoyed doing in the middle 90s was serving on the Kellogg Commission on the Future of State and Land Grant Universities, which uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, and uh, helped write one of their reports called The Engaged Institution. According to that group, it's the redesign of teaching, research, extension, and service functions to become more sympathetically and productively involved with community concerns and needs. This was coming from presidents of state universities and land-grant institutions and represented a considerable advance of thinking over the usual land-grant model, which is an extension model in which knowledge is transmitted sometimes interpreted, but certainly it transmitted to clients who require that information. But rarely in the old way of thinking about extension was there a condition set up for actual generation of knowledge. There are some very key features of engagement itself, a common agenda and a sharing of responsibility as well as risk and a reward amongst the various partners, including higher ed and the institutions that, and, and community groups that make up a community. This one is very difficult, an ability to share power and resources equitably with the community. The creation of a shared learning environment in which knowledge is created from both the usual approach we're all familiar with, the research model, which is explicit, and tacit knowledge, which is carried as a result of a community of practice that defines the community, its condition, how things get done around here. Uh, and similar tacit knowledge exists on campuses and does not often get drawn into the kind of vetting of, of information and knowledge that is part of the usual research environment. And most importantly, the inclusion of community concerns as a legitimate set of expectations about what we should expect from a partnership. This is very difficult. When I was in Portland and started trying to work on child and family issues with the Oregon state government branch that dealt with those matters, I blithely brought some of our faculty together with some of their administrators and some uh, community leaders and assumed that they would come back to me in a month or two with a, an engagement plan. Would you care to guess how long it actually took before they not only agreed on a set of goals, but agreed on what success would look like? Want to guess? Correct. It was almost exactly two years. I, on my two-month time frame, became somewhat impatient. I almost put one of those little Mr. Peanut thingies on here, but decided it would not behoove my dignity as a representative of the federal government, so instead I've still got the, you know, the little thingy there. But, but think of that as a peanut for a moment. <laughs> Engagement must be reciprocal, requiring the creation of a shared agenda, and mutually beneficial. Those are very demanding expectations whether it's to support community development or enrich the student experience or deepen the interests of both faculty and students and the problems represented by the community experience, the results are profound for the university side. What is set up in a good community collaboration is the notion of collaborative learning. There are four things. I should tell you the source of these four things. They came from a bulletin board 
in the St. Johnsbury uh, Extension Service office in Vermont. They came from somebody's church newsletter, and I have carried and I have changed them into academic language, in order not to reveal the source, but. I am revealing it to you because I wanted to make a point, which is that community knowledge is often profoundly significant in helping all of the partners to rethink their direction. Um, a discipline of reflection using real information rather than perceptions was on that bulletin board something like, you say you know it, how do you know? New patterns of conversation. It was, so who do you talk to? Adoption of manageable risk and a commitment to experimentation was, have you tried it? You see that what you can do if you're an academic, you can turn a perfectly reasonable set of things into something impenetrable. And so I'm choosing to model that for you, uh, which is why it took two years to get you know, the creation of new information and new patterns of information flow. I don't remember what that one was. I think it was, so who else knows, or something like that. It was absolutely wonderful. What is a learning community? It's a network of people skilled at creating, acquiring, interpreting, and transferring knowledge. And the other half of this is critical, because any faculty member at a good institution can do those things all by himself or herself. <clears throat> but the other half is a little more demanding and at modifying its behavior to reflect new knowledge and insights. If you study the management literature, say Peter Senge is the fifth discipline, you'll find there are some features associated with this kind of behavior, either inside an organization that gets its moving parts working together in some way, or within a community that draws people together from a number of places. Systematic problem solving, experimentation with new approaches, learning from past experience and history, learning from experiences and best practices of others. I learned today that the Institute has thrived on stealing other people's ideas. That's called best practices of others. <laughs> and transferring, but, but in addition, other people steal from the Institute. So it, it's a commerce of ideas. Uh, transferring knowledge quickly and efficiently throughout the organization. In a true learning organization of any kind, everybody is a learner, and that is the most critical feature of university community partnerships. Everybody is a learner and can contribute to the quality and impact and value of the work that either the organization itself does or that the group of people who have temporarily come together as a collaboration may do. Most importantly for me, coming out of the academic tradition where uh, once you've determined how exquisitely important the questions are, you stop, um, to integrate thinking and acting at all levels of the organization or in the community group. And the role of a leader who can be at any part in this network, not necessarily, quote, the persons in charge, is to challenge the mental models that underlie the the assumptions that people are working with, the sort of pop psychology, pop pedagogy, to use Jerome Bruner's ideas, or folk pedagogy and folk psychology, that, that influence how we interpret each other's behavior and what we think is important and what isn't, and uh, as a result, foster more systematic patterns of thinking. Uh, the way I ended up boiling this down as a president, and I still do this at NSF to the everlasting annoyance of my colleagues, is so you know that. How do you know it, and why should I care? Now, of course, I would say that in a gentle, modulated tone of voice. <laughs> now, why are we doing this? Well, it's about democracy. Remember democracy? A idea that has guided my thinking since the mid-1990s is a different ideal of a democratic community in which both the differences we sh that we bear and the connections we share can be held together, yet understood at times to be necessarily separate, sometimes paradoxical, and in contradiction to one another. Now, people who study how the mind works point out that paradoxes are very helpful because they really do begin to 
force us to look underneath the surface of our assumptions and figure out what we really do know and how we know it. And so one of the benefits of a community collaboration between a university or college and various parts of a community is that we begin to work toward this kind of democracy in which everybody is a learner, everybody's a teacher, and everybody has something to contribute. Democracy as well as education, quoting John Dewey, who uh, was a distinguished graduate of the University of Vermont, and as far as I know, the only dead person on campus, because he was buried there, um, <laughs> must be, and I would commune with his spirit regularly. I, I do have a, a, a bone to pick with John Dewey, however, because he has great big letters on this monument, and underneath it says, and his wife. And I was annoyed by this. Um, must be a way of life built on the concepts of growth and individuality and, and, as John Dewey would say, an ongoing experiment in associated living. So what I'm talking about is something that is the product of interactions that has many meanings beyond the actual product of those interactions. It creates a different sense of community. It creates an experiment in associated living. And for students who are part of this, whether they are elementary, middle, or high school students, or undergraduates, or graduate students, or postdocs, or returning adults getting various kinds of continuing professional development that involves a community component, it is in fact an experiment that has deep educational value as well. Because the participants learn together no matter what their age or prior experience or expertise. I'll give you an example. In Portland, Oregon, we had something called the Portland Educational Network and the Portland Educational Roundtable, of which I was a member. Uh, and the way this worked was you could be a member if you had resources to bring to the table. And I had Portland State University, which was a considerable resource. And our goal was to ensure that 100% of the students who made it to the high school level would graduate from high school. And we all wore little buttons saying 100%. And a lot of people misinterpreted this, wondering what the 100% meant. Did it mean we were 100% people or that we were genuine? No, it, it was referring to this goal. Well, we sat around for about a year and a half trying to figure out why young people drop out of school. We had learned experts come tell us why they thought young people drop out of school. We shared stories of our own sons and daughters and friends they'd had who dropped out of school. None of us would admit our sons or daughters had dropped out of school, although I subsequently found out a couple of my colleagues did have that unfortunate experience. Finally, one day, and at this point, many years later, I cannot remember who suggested it, someone said, brightly, why don't we ask the young people? <laughs> what a concept. So, remember, participants learn together no matter what their age or prior experience and expertise. The young people knew the answer, of course. Can you tell, or have you any idea, what the answer the young people gave to the question of why kids drop out of school? Boring? Drugs, irrelevant, work, wrong. What they said was, because no adult notices or cares. Now, they said some of the other things, too. But we had spent years in that community creating various kinds of elaborate strategies. And it turns out every single one of them got adults and young people together in such a way that they had something to share with each other and the kid felt noticed, appreciated, cared about, dot, dot. So many things can be learned. The purpose of this is to create something that I'm going to sort of draw back to a higher principle. It is civic virtue. The knowledge of the public good and the sustained desire to achieve it is one way to put it. Uh, Robert Dahl wrote a book on democracy and the mid-90s and gave that definition, which I think is a good one. Both the opportunity and incentives to acquire the necessary knowledge and the predisposition to act steadily on the basis of that knowledge are the instrumentality underneath that statement. Where better to learn this than to be sitting there as a 15-year-old who's dropped out of school 
talking to a bunch of very distinguished, gray-haired looking people and having them go, oh. So what does it mean for a college or a university to embrace its civic responsibility and try to set up the conditions that I'm talking about to play a role in generating a renewal of democracy? through the expectations we have of ourselves as scholars and administrators. I used to think I was a scholar administrator, and I could prove it too. I, I thought regularly, in fact daily, I thought. Um, our aspirations for our students and the nature and intentions of our own institutional relationships with the broader society of which we're a part. Now the results of this commitment are certainly tangible, because you can see actions addressing particular, we hope, community identified or mutually identified problems, but also intangible. And it may be the intangible that's more important than the tangible, at least from my own perspective. In the form of the practice of the habits of learning and interaction that the concept of democracy I've been promoting to you requires of all of us. You cannot be a citizen in our contemporary society without generating and using knowledge. So how can we do this? Well, we can find a way to link learning and community life through the design of the curriculum. We can serve as a center and resource for community building on the community's terms. And that's certainly something the Institute is very proud of doing. And we can use our distinctive strengths, which are very much based on traditions of our institutions the history of our institutions, the resources we have to bring to bear through both scholarship and outreach or engagement to strengthen community life. Now, partnerships are hard. Uh, how many of you are actively in some kind of partnership that stretches you across one boundary or another between what you know and where you're headed? Not too many, but maybe I gave the wrong definition. I bet you most of you are. Even a marriage is a partnership, so you know. <laughs> An ideal partnership matches up the strengths and goals of the university with the assets and interests of the community. And there's no such thing, of course, as a universal community. And the real challenge for any academic institution is to find ways to ensure that engagement is seen as a legitimate and scholarly activity of faculty and students and staff. It's important to take some time to think about what the university actually can bring to a partnership. Uh, again, using Portland State as an example, um, I remember a shouting match with the mayor one time who insisted that Portland State University was a public library and everyone in the whole community should be able to take all the books out whenever they wanted to. My point was, no, we're actually not a public library because, in fact, our assets are collected for the education and the intellectual development of our faculty, staff, and students. And we welcome other people who have legitimate intellectual reasons for wanting to use our materials to do so, but we're not going to supplement the Portland Public Library whose budget you wish to cut by 50%. I failed to give you that last piece of information. So what assets do you actually have and what's really available is important. A good collaboration will continue to evolve and must continue to evolve because the ideas you had at the beginning and what you know about each other will change as a result of both time and face-to-face -face interactions. I will point out though that some communities are being partnered to the point of exhaustion. I still remember um, actually back in SUNY Albany days going to talk to one of the uh, high school's uh, principals who said, I don't want to partner with you. I already have too many other partners. And my response was, but we're such a good partner. And their response was, no, you're not. Um, so I went back and thought seriously and had to agree with that individual that we were a terrible partner at the time and we got better at it. Community partnerships have to be accompanied by what I call a culture of evidence. I stole that from Steve Weiner, who was at that time the executive director of the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, a commissioner of which I was. But I believe he stole it from someone else. So 
from the point of view of, of scholarly authenticity, this is a stolen metaphor. Um, but the idea is to keep a running assessment of how well the partnership is working from the point of view of all the participants and not just sort of head along and not pause to think about what's happening. What we're trying to do here is in collaborations of all kinds around the country, make a distinction between information, which can be transmitted fairly readily because it really isn't dependent on any individual, and knowledge, which is associated with particular knowers and is deeply situated in a physical and social context. This is an idea that I've heard a number of times in recent years, but this particular example is from a wonderful article called Growing Up Digital by John Seely Brown. In moving beyond transmission of information to the generation and sharing of knowledge, we're entering a realm that, as John Seely Brown would say, embraces the social context, resources, background, and history within which information itself resides. It's in this context that innovation can be fostered. And we are in a building which represents a focus for a remarkable uh, community of innovation, where no innovation, which is the fostering and conversion of knowledge to things of practical value, both in community problem solving and economic development, can thrive. Kinds of problems that must be addressed in economic and community development require the creation of such a community of learning. And Pensacola is very fortunate because you have uh, basically a creative community, a neighborhood made up of not only the scientists who are affiliated with this institute, but artists and architects. I'll even allow a few lawyers in the, in the combination of things. Uh, interesting places all over this community, uh, maintained by interesting and very creative people. Most of us did not become part of a community of practice as we were developing our education, nor did we, did we really learn what it means to draw upon the distinctive qualities of other fields and the experiences, both tacit and explicit, of others. The fortunate thing that you have is that that's something that this group is learning to do. Rethinking what constitutes an interesting question, a warrant for truth, sufficient even elegant evidence, the interaction between theory, observation, and the challenging role of practice, the value of a special vocabulary and the concepts that are packed into that language and even the syntax of the way in which people talk about their subjects. In the context of a collaboration, you can't distinguish knowledge generation and consumption anymore. We have a number of examples uh, from the point of view of a university. Students who are working in local businesses, part-time students who are also citizens in the region. Portland State, 85% of the students lived and worked in the greater metropolitan area within about an hour's drive of the campus. So we didn't have to worry about reaching out to citizens. The citizens were on our campus. New companies spun off from university research, employees being retrained on campus, knowledge coming from community sources as well as from experts at the university to create what Brown again refers to as a learning ecology where a community is actually learning together. We need to capture the importance of an enlightened and capable citizenry to the democratic way of life and the maintenance of our sense of community through this wonderful social intellectual capital generated from learning together. The community that learns together stays together, right? There are lots of new forms of these lifelong learning. The implications of the learning organization and how organizations are working and the changing role of learning within larger organizations is certainly one way. Another is the movement toward community-based decision making in school systems with local school councils healthcare delivery, social service delivery, economic um, development councils, community development strategies, the need to provide support for continuous learning of the people who are involved in these kinds of community-based decision-making activities. The expansion of integrative models that 
blend not only the preparation for a profession, but also the continued development of people in that profession and research generated in community settings. Some of the most interesting examples of this are professional development schools and education, area health education centers called AHECs that are partially sponsored by the federal government at NICHD and elsewhere, um, that began to create within a community the natural generation of the kind of knowledge that not only improves decision making, as I suggested in one of the previous versions of this, but also improves professional practice. Cohort models being employed at the graduate level in master's programs like business, healthcare, education, social services, which provide access to advanced education often at a distance from a university or a college, and which create a natural learning network within that cohort. There are also doctoral cohorts. I actually taught a class, a, a doctoral level class at George Washington University this spring that was a doctoral cohort. There were people from all over the country participating, many of them electronically. New forms of consulting and program design that bring two or more education providers together with um, either individual employers or clusters of related businesses to create the equivalent of HMOs and EAPs. Those are, for your benefit, educational maintenance organizations and educational assistance programs rather than employee assistance programs. There are some very interesting examples of this around the country. And what they do is they create the knowledge engine that creates greater productivity and output. New options for completing college level work in various settings, such as high schools, new forms of educational articulation that offer better access and opportunity for additional education, and new pathways to the kinds of advanced education needed to pursue some of the options that are now available uh, in our society. So the net result is that learning becomes a more complex concept that includes all aspects of scholarly work, which I define as sort of a ripoff of Ernest Boyer, uh, discovery, integration, interpretation, and application, conducted by different groups of people in a variety of settings. It's no longer simply absorbing knowledge transmitted by an expert. The way I like to put this is, in the past, higher education has tended to hold constant that which ought to vary, and is allowed to vary that which ought to be held constant. Well, which is which? What should never vary, what should always be constant, is the quality of the work held to very rigorous standards. That, of course, has been allowed to vary enormously. What should be allowed to vary is where the questions come from, who participates in the work, who interprets the results, and who applies it. And, of course, we have in the past held that as a constant. It was the faculty transmitting the knowledge to others. The net result of these models is that lifelong learning is now both an avenue for sustaining individual skills and competence and something that strengthens the shared competencies of groups and organizations. It includes increasingly a component of discovery and application, not just learning other people's information. Universities must assume the responsibility for creating the educational environments needed to support this kind of learning, but they also have to embrace the fact that they're no longer the only or even primary source of the information and knowledge needed to address the most pressing societal issues. I am reminding of what happened when the financial industry opened up. It used, when I was a youth, I had to go to the bank with my little savings book to deposit my 25 cents a week. Now, that's because I'm so old. Um, nowadays, I don't do that, do I? I go online. But in addition, I have many, many options for how to invest my money, many different kinds of organizations that will happily help me do so. And so what is the role of the college or university or research generator in a contemporary society? And my answer is it is the means by which 
knowledge is brought together, people are brought together, and the interpretation is facilitated. Now, economic development strategies reflect this. Prior to World War II, most people described economic development as smokestack chasing. In the southern part of the United States, that was cheap labor, cheap land, and low taxes. In the north, which didn't have any of the above, it was tax abatements, training programs, subsidy programs, etc. By the time we got into the 1970s, we were addressing global competitiveness, and the focus at that point became on workplace skills, uh, dealing with deficits in the workplace, access to technology, modernization, new product capital, with an emphasis now not so much on trying to steal a company from the state across the way, but on small businesses and retaining and expanding those kinds of companies. The third wave, and a lot of places are still in this wave, although there are some moving to a fourth version, which I'll describe, was regional and local strategies and community development. There were networks and consortia to support and encourage job creation and diversification of the economy. There were local intermediaries that identified opportunities and assets and figured out how to invest. These might be economic development councils, for instance, workforce investment boards. Public dollars were used to leverage partnerships. Comprehensive policies and programs were based on regional approaches, the idea that a region was the economic engine. And in fact, during the Clinton administration, we actually came up with about 132 of these. And it's very interesting because Ken showed me today a map of where the, the uh, high-end knowledge activities are going on, and I wish I still had the copy I had of where those regions were because I think it'd be interesting to compare and see which ones have actually gone red and orange and which have stayed rather dull as, reddish, as bluish and green. Competition is used to test models and strategies. It's, it's basically an experimental model. And instead of getting grants, people get investments and they're held to return on investment and accountability. This, of course, is also happening to higher education with an emphasis on a higher level of accountability, consistent investment in higher ed and research capacity, and an emphasis on the quality of K-12 education. Well, we're moving now into a fourth wave strategy, and I didn't bother to, uh, can you envision a triangle? Let me check. How many of you can imagine a triangle? Very good. How many of you had an equilateral triangle? Even better, because then you read my mind. This is an equilateral triangle. It is bordered on one side by the quality of the education system, which is not just to produce highly educated people. It's to attract the high-end people to the community, because the quality of the educational system matters to them if they're planning to raise a family or if they themselves want to go on to further education. Workforce development and the creation of a quality workforce, because as these kinds of people get going, they spin out jobs. And the question is, will the local community be able to absorb those jobs, or will that community become a grand attractor beam for well-educated people from somewhere else? And finally, economic development strategies, which are aligned with community development strategies to create sustainable communities, a term that I'm not sure everyone would agree on, but it's basically a community whose assets will be so developed that children and grandchildren unto the seventh generation, to use a Northwest Indian term, will find a community that is desirable to live in, whose resources have been uh, maintained and effective stewardship for their inheritance. A highly educated and trained workforce is part of this with access to continuing education access to high quality research, excellent communication and transportation infrastructure, a physically attractive environment, boy Pensacola sure has that, as well as a number of these other features, excellently managed local public services and effective use of public resources to sustain a genuinely embedded local regional strategy. Now the components are important, educational reform has to prepare students for a lifetime of learning in order to participate in the kind of collaborations I've been talking about. 
that emphasizes rigorous academics for everyone. There's been a real shift in the past decade. We no longer think that some of the most important intellectual tools of our society are for the privileged few. We're trying to ensure that all children and all adults have the competencies, whether it's communication capacity, access to technology, knowledge of science, mathematics, literacy in these fields, in order to be capable citizens, in order to be able to contribute to society and benefit from it. Workforce development strategies need to focus on long-term development as well as the immediate training needs of employers and employees. In other words, to adopt a career orientation rather than a particular job orientation and to promote the development of leadership, if in many cases down to the neighborhood level. And economic strategies need to be effectively aligned with both of those other components, which is why my picture is an equilateral triangle. This isn't easy to do. For a university to be part of this, there must be the possibility of reward or benefit and a connection to the curriculum. There needs to be individual influence and inspired leadership throughout the institution, not just from the top, although the top provides the safety for others to express this leadership. An institution responsive to the needs of the community it serves that engages in educational planning and purposefulness. One of the things I've learned is that mindlessness is a guarantee that there will not be effective change. Mindfulness and purposefulness are no guarantee, but they certainly increase the odds. A willingness to adopt a shared agenda and a shared resource base. You've heard that before because that's one of the underlying characteristics of engagement and the capacity to change. Community-based work must be valued. Faculty and student work must be rigorously understood, documented, and interpreted. And mediating structures have to be put in place to make it easier to do. I had a long conversation one day with a faculty member who had been extremely interested in service learning activities and in fact had been working closely with the Portland City Council to uh, engage his students in developing materials that would be of use in critical decision making, policy making, who had abruptly abandoned this work. I, as an inquisitive president, stopped by his office one day. I just read one of those books about manage by walking around and I was practicing it, so I walked around and this was dangerous because people thought I was going to take their offices away or something. But <laughs> And I said, never mind who, I'll call him George. George, why did you stop doing this? And he said, because of spiral binding. Well, you know, presidents are supposed to know a lot, but that didn't convey a lot of information to me. So I said, George, explain spiral binding. He said, we got through an incredibly important project, and it was time to prepare it in appropriately professional form to present to the city council and I could find no money to pay for the cost of the spiral binding of the reports. I paid for it out of my own pocket and abandoned service learning. My presidential thought balloon was, oh shit. <laughs> I did not say that. I thought it. Mediating structures refers to everything from what is the liability plan associated with putting your kids on a van and taking them downtown, to spiral binding, to helping a faculty member who really is interested in connecting his or her educational goals to community work to find an appropriate partner and a focus for that interest and everything beyond. Opportunities must be provided for faculty, staff, and students to develop the skills to participate in these programs. One of the most critical things I learned was many of the things going on across a university involve people's lives. They involve personal information. They involve invading their privacy with their permission, of course. 
They involve handling information that could affect that person's future. So it's very important that both students and faculty take time to understand the ethical dimensions of being involved with a community. What might be the impact on the institution? A rethinking of the core of the academy itself, the very nature of scholarship, moving from the classic research, teaching, and service to something that the Kellogg Commission called discovery, learning, and engagement. What do I mean by this? Discovery, learning, and engagement in contrast to research, teaching, and service. On the left, research, teaching, and service is something faculty define what their research mission will be, what the curriculum will be, and how it will be conducted, what service they will provide in the form of transmission of knowledge and expertise. Discovery, learning, and engagement is a shared activity of the kind that I've been promoting this afternoon. In the university of the 21st century, success will be defined by, as it always has been, by the rigor of scholarly work but that scholarly work will now have the qualities I've been talking about. By the quality of the educational experience of the students, by the effectiveness of the partnerships that link the university with the community, and by the impact of the institution on the quality of life of citizens in the state, the nation, and the world, depending upon the reach of that institution's collaboration. From the point of view of the community, I think although I haven't produced separate slides for it, it creates the capacity to engage in associated living, the capacity to collaborate, the knowledge base required to solve community problems, the creation of attractiveness to the kinds of people you would like to retain in your community and draw to the community, the range of people with skills and backgrounds and experiences that create the diversity that makes a community lively, Pensacola is certainly seeking in many ways to retain that kind of diversity through the variation of the cost of your housing stock, through the mixed facilities you're building, through the attempt to retain your historical character while at the same time providing for an attractive environment for the kind of talented people that you hope will become your future as well as retain in your present. And so there are a lot of ways in which all you have to do is walk out the door of this facility and look around and you see a community which is seeking to be like this. Although your own local language for it may be rather different from the language I've used which comes from my own experience in other communities than this one, but the notion that a university or an institute and the community have no bounds and boundaries, that the co-mingling is so intense and so complete that the qualities of the resulting experience are a blend of all of those different assets is an idea that ought to be familiar to you and is part of your thinking about community development and part of the motivation and reason why a number of people who are affiliated with this organization choose to live and work here. As Ken would explain it, because living and working need to be integrated and need to be part of a full life experience. And the scale of the, of the community, its characteristics as a place to live, reinforce that belief. It's also the case that the kind of collaborative model I'm describing contributes to the idea that you cannot partition a life into work and the rest of your life or intellectual work and community work. In fact, these are, in the world I'm describing, the same thing. Thank you. <laughs>